Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 335 with me, your guest, Agostino Zinga. This is the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 335 with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. What's going on? What's happening? Great. Glad to hear it. Before we carry on with the show, if you like what you hear, and if you like what you've heard, and if you like what you see, and if you like what you've seen, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. So it can help spread the show. That's all I ask from you, man. That's all I ask. I'm not asking you to borrow your bicycle that you just bought the other day. I'm not asking you to lend me a fiver so I can restore the negative balance on my Oyster card. I'm not even asking you to borrow an Afro comb. God damn it, I do need a comb. All I'm asking is that you smash like down below, hit subscribe and leave me a comment. And if you listen via the podcast, I've been just hearing the audio. You're just hearing me. My sensual voice coming at you live and direct, right? Live and direct. Make sure you leave a five-star review and share the show with your friends, even via the audio platforms. Anyway, um, yeah, all that aside, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Good? Good. I'm good. How am I? Good, 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 good. As you can tell, I'm alert. I'm awake. Um, blueberry uh, shake in the morning gets you nice and hyper, right? You start bouncing off the walls. I feel good, right? Blueberry, uh, blueberry shakes with a bit of, you know... Um, with some um, nice seeds. I don't know what seeds they are, but there's some mixed seeds I have that I chucked into my shake. It's sort of like ketamine, isn't it? When you're on that, all right? You remember the first time you took some ketamine? How crazy that was, eh? Even the name ketamine, it makes it sound so cracky, isn't it? Ketamine. Ket. Oh, bloody hell. I remember the first time I did that. I've done it, what, twice in my life? Once when I didn't know it was what it was and once when I knew what it was and I just thought, you know those nights when you're out, you're like, you know what? Let's just throw the baby out the window. Rags, let's go, innit? Let's go. I just thought, bloody hell, let's do it. And I took like a bump that was like, I don't know, the size of my nail. And I've got those long African nails as well. So you know that bump was strong and aggressive. That went <gasps> up into my brain, like, <sharp inhale> out of frame. You know that one there? Like, it just went, I went sky high, brother. Not, it's, that, that's, um, that's when I realized I wasn't really about that life, you know? I wasn't really about the ketamine life. You know what I mean? That wasn't for me because... I was like, God, it makes you question your, <laughs> it makes you question your, um, your resilience when you go out, when you see people doing it on night after night. It's like guys that take speed when they go out. Like that's big in the Berlin scene, isn't it? Techno and doing speed. And it's like, why would you want to be that rushy? Like that sweaty with your heart beating that fast, especially listen to music that's like 125 BPM plus, right? Some hardcore nights are like 140 BPM minimum. And then you're all dosed up on, on bloody on speed. I mean, it must be mad, brother. So I can, and then Ket obviously does the opposite. He's like, you're just, you're like in slow motion, like you're doing those kind of, you know, there's um, you know, those those footlock adverts where somebody break dancing and they're always like, with a pair of dead air maxes on. I wonder, do they still do full look adverts? I don't know. I don't have a TV because I'm a hipster. I don't have a TV. <laughs> um, I watch everything on my cracked smartphone. You know what I mean? I'm out here living a life. Um, but yeah, man, what an era. What an era. It's crazy though because I, I don't know. Maybe it's for you guys or maybe it's only something that I recognize. But I'm seeing a lot of comedians freaking out online, innit, right? Especially the ones I follow. Um, you know, obviously partly based on the whole Chris D'Elia situation, partly based on the idea that their industry is basically done, isn't it? It's kaput, isn't it? Any live show or any sort of live gathering or any sort of mass gathering of people, that, that is out the window, especially with places flaring up, you know, different states in the, United, in the United States are locking down again or they're kind of, you know, reining back the easing of the lockdown. So um, essentially that industry of like live events, Mass gathering to people, it's just basically off the table. But I've not seen a lot of DJs complaining about it. I don't what well, maybe it's because some of them have got big deals with like, you know, magazines like Mix Mag and they're streaming on there, or they've got a partnership with Boiler Room, or they're doing stuff with, I don't know, a whole bevy of online radio stations and channels that are like, you know, streaming and some people are like, I don't know, Plastician has done really well. He's 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 heavy on Twitch, but he was heavy on Twitch prior to lockdown. So he's built he's amassed like a good little audience on there and he's obviously um got some other stragglers on to kind of um got um, help him out as well so I'm assuming that's probably a been a bit beneficial and there's obviously some people who've been making mad amount of tracks and uploading that stuff onto Bandcamp and getting a good little split on that but I've not seen a lot of DJs complaining 
Um, but I've seen a lot of comedians really going crazy. Um, you know, even someone like Joe Rogan has kind of descended into a bit of madness when it comes to the whole mask debate, right? He was going ham with people not wearing masks. Like, and then now he kind of, I think he backtracked. He, was, he, he had an interview with Jon Stewart and he was like, oh, I was only joking when I was kind of goading. He, was, he basically said he was goading Bill Burr into response when Bill Burr did, did that sort of like infamous um you know, clap back and raged upon, you know, Joe and the people that go out there and tell people not to wear a mask. He then, oh no, it was, it was a joke. I was only playing around. I was just trying to poke him so he could react and, and rant. It's like, come on, bruv. No, he wasn't. If you watch the podcast enough, you know that Joe Rogan has been anti-mask from the very beginning. Um, He's never really been broadcasting that he wears one. He's never been, he, he's always been said, no, mask doesn't really make a difference. He kind of like, you know, poo-poos it. It was a way of it kind of demonstrating his machismo, which is what it is, isn't it? Do what you want, but they've been going crazy the comedians because I think they have a realisation that their careers are essentially on hold especially for the comedians who had kind of put to kind of poo poo the idea of doing podcasts and you know appearing on them and doing online stuff because I'd imagine making your and, and again maybe it's an America thing too because they love leasing stuff right they love having a bit of they love renting cars and you know renting their homes and whatever it may be so you can just imagine what their monthly spend or their monthly bills are like in you know, over there um, and you get accustomed to that lifestyle and you know for the best part of 20 years you've had it and it's been sustained it's been a, it's been a sustainable lifestyle a sustainable career and now all of a sudden out of nowhere it's over right for the foreseeable future i've said from the beginning it's done until the end of the year right until you know we get live events again especially in the places where we haven't really handled corona well united north america um obviously the united kingdom we're gonna be off the radar for a while i think if you want to go and rave if you want to go to see a live show go spain go germany go to new zealand go to switzerland although they've had to kind of rein things back in again austria there's places that you can go uruguay oh no sorry lithuania i think it's another one where's the place where they're gonna do there's a festival called um i forgot it's called it's the first one it's, it's popping up i think in august i forgot where it's, it's so there's place that you can go if you want to have a good time and see some people and hang around in big groups and whatever it may be but the uk and north america not happening sir and one reason why that won't be happening is because of individuals such as this right this is a little clip that i found um that i thought was funny uh, da, 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 da. this one right and it kind of encapsulates what's basically going on in america and in the worldwide isn't it? in terms of the mask thing it's just really bizarre and um, how people are really are reacting to it but hey i don't know man i guess because it's so maddening it kind of makes you go a bit mad anyway in general right maybe that's the thing i don't know but i thought this clip was really funny let me play it for you now this is um, uh, a clip from what? WPEC uh, CBS 12 News. It's gonna, you're going to hear it now. We are being lied to. Our freedoms are being taken forever. And I will not be muzzled like a mad dog. And I will not have my health destroyed. Because you idiots can't figure, can't read truth. You go along with the lies that are the people who are trying to take down our freedoms and destroy our country. This is sick. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for being a part of this. And I will not be muzzled. And, my, and it's time for us to stand up for our freedom. Because if we stand back and let these pieces of crap handle our freedoms, we will have nothing left. In fact, we'll end up being dead. Amen. We are being... Interesting perspective, isn't it, right? Interesting. Um... Again, I just this part of me that kind of admires the ability to be that loud, um, the ability to be that certain of your opinion when it's quite clear that you're an absolute idiot. Like you know, not even to be not even to be you know out of order. You are essentially incredibly dumb, or you're essentially un, you're not well informed at the subject at hand. On the subject at hand, on the subject at hand. So, yeah, you're not, you're not well informed in general. I, I honestly so I so admire it. It's something that you so uh, something that I kind of um, heard a lot of when I used to speak to people about football. Now I don't do that so much. I try to keep my opinions to myself because most people don't watch football the way I do or the way most fans of actual football watch football. Right? I kind of watch highlight shows of European matches. I follow certain podcasts. I watch stuff on YouTube. I'm on forums. You know, I'm I'm I give a shit about the game, right? But when you mention it casually to like a casual fan, they'll have these mad off the cuff opinions about stuff, and you'll be like, "What?" Right? And you'll get you'll engage in like a little debate, and then quick quite quickly you realize, "Oh, you're just like." 
not really that well informed, then it? it's not a bad thing. It's just I'm I'm assuming you're as informed as me and you're making that your decision or you're making you're forming your opinion based on the information I have as well. That's why I just can't understand it. If we have the same information points or we have the same data points, we should be amongst you know, we should be in the same zone when it comes to an opinion, but they're not. They're way off the mark. You're like, oh okay, cool, I get it. So I used to stop so I stopped kind of, you know, sharing my opinions on football in general because, you know, there's no need to um try and be the smartest guy in a room on a subject that I'm well versed in. It doesn't, you know, there's not necessarily any value in that. But I'm a, I admire when people are so quick to share their opinion on subjects that they have no idea about. Like, just be so confident in it. And this guy's talking about being muzzled like a mad dog as if, like... And this is a... It's, it's probably the American thing, but something we've seen in the UK too because there's loads of people in the UK who aren't wearing a mask, who aren't wearing a mask in general. Um, this idea that somehow wearing a mask is taken away from your right to express yourself, your right to be autonomous, your right to be independent... Um, your right for free will, your yeah, free, it's impeding on your free will. Um, is somehow the first step to making you subordinate to these mysterious powers that be that are aiming to take over your life and you know take away your family and you know kill your dog in front of your eyes. I don't know. It's just a bizarre way of, of thinking about it, as if the government would need to wait for a global pandemic in order to you know listen in on what you're speaking about at home or to spy on you at work or something like they're doing that already right the fact that you think that a pandemic is going to be um the trojan horse that's going to allow them in is really naive in it and uh, uh quite cute if you think about it but jesus man the amount of conviction this guy has for being so simple-minded is just really astounding and again this is also maybe a fair reflection on the leadership in it most people especially in the uk they've been quite hands-off with the whole mask thing oh you know do what you want you know but we do advise you to stay alert, which we don't, which is so vague, it, you know, it beggars belief. So maybe if they had a bit more direction and a bit more leadership and there was a bit more insistence on what you should and shouldn't be doing and it wasn't left up to interpretation, they would be in a better, far better place. And now in America, they're in a place where, which is really the catastrophic place, right? You're in a place where you open up and now you have to close because the virus is getting out of control, which must be a real, real kick in the teeth, especially when it's approaching, what, 4th of July weekend, right? Independence Day for the, for the, uh, for the people over there in the States, a time for them to celebrate and pop all the fireworks that, that they want and get dressed up in the, you know, in the famous stars and stripes, now that's going to be taken away from them. That must be so heartbreaking. And you'd think, though, if you're, if you're that admitted, again, maybe it's just me. I would imagine, if I was a politician, if I was Boris Johnson, I wouldn't be able to wear a mask, right? And I'd want to get them on board. I would just tell them, hey, if you commit to wearing a mask and saying, you know, and actually abiding by social distancing rules, you know, not going to visit your friends and throwing house parties and stuff, we could get this knocked, we can knock this out of the park and then we could probably have re realistically rescue our summer by, by July. That could be an optimistic goal, right? And then you have everybody working together for a common good, um, banding together, um, sort of helping each other out to make sure they got things under control. But there was no, none of, none, no such incentive was there. And it's a common thing that you do, even if you have a diet, right? I'm on a diet at the moment and I have a cheat day on a Saturday. That's when, that's when I kind of pig out and, you know, carb load and go and eat all the, you know, processed stuff that I want to eat. That's a little reward you give yourself so that the days that you're fed up of eating chicken and broccoli, you have something to look forward to. You have an incentive to sort of like do it for one more day, two more days, three more days until you hit Saturday, right? You do that to yourself. So why couldn't the government do that to us? Why couldn't it give us a little incentive? Like, hey, guys, if you do this, we're going to, I don't know, we're going to enact this uh, tax policy change. We're going to find, we're going to push this amount of money into the NHS, this amount of money into social services, whatever it may be, something to give people some sort of incentive, some sort of common goal to reach for. But instead, nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. But again, what do I know? Isn't it? I'm just a, I'm just a random guy from a random place talking out of his arsehole. Next one. We have a journalist in California who decided to go on an absolute epic rant regarding the dire state uh, the dire state that California is in at the moment um, with COVID. It seems like they had no cases. I heard a lot of people bragging in the LA scene, especially the comedy scene, about how low the numbers were. And this is when the fact Brendan Shaw, the absolute savant that he is, was going on and like, I'm a numbers guy. The numbers are so low. <laughs> now look, look how far the numbers have spiked, mostly because of the protests and mostly because of the relaxed um, lockdown rules. The numbers have spiked up super 
super sky high and they're probably going to have to go and lock under lockdown or they're going to have to rein in the easing of the lockdown somewhat in the same sense of what happened in Texas. And this journalist um, perfectly, 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 perfectly um, sort of encapsulate the current sentiment amongst some people that live in California regarding the absolute horror show that they have done in order to keep the virus at bay. After waiting for two hours and now getting two minutes, I'll get right to the point. Uh, this board is pretending that for the last three months, your emperor, Dr. Levin, has not been against a mask declaration. Now, all of a sudden, we're pretending that masks are everything, even forcing <laughs> speakers to use masks. I would like the board to take a position. Was Dr. Levin wrong for those three months? That's a and question. if he was this wrong, why has he not been removed? Why has he not been fired for being so catastrophically wrong? And I wonder, right? I really do wonder. Governments around the world that have done a really crappy job when it comes to COVID-19, will they be held accountable by their citizens for the poor job they've done? Especially the ones that were so hard. I, I don't mind if you were like confused or you weren't sure about the science and you're trying to get a grip on the numbers and you're just trying to weigh out your options and even what um, Sweden done with the herd immunity I don't really mind that they were quite quick out of the gates in terms of saying here's our approach we're going to ascribe with the herd immunity approach and if it works out for us it works out but this is what we're going to commit to doing and they knew the pros and knew the cons and they went with it fine it's this sort of like um, non-action, right? This sort of like uh, pretending you're doing something, like ruffling, you know, just kind of fiddling around with papers, sort of mucking around on the shelf, reorganizing a set of wall, a wall of trainers to make it look like you're busy. That is the annoying part of it. Are they going to be held accountable by their citizens? They actually should. But I'm wondering if once COVID is eased, eased down, once COVID is kind of settled down and maybe there's a vaccine on the way and lockdown gets eased, people will be so tired and so bored about talking about COVID-19, they're just going to move on with their lives. They don't want to revisit it. So they won't get held, held accountable. But I'm hoping that there's a small minority of people out there that are going to hold these officials' feet to the fire and demand some kind of change, right? Look at my finger. I'm, I'm even doing the politician thing. If you're not watching, I'm doing a little fun thing that politicians do so they don't point. Or do you not really believe he was wrong you're just wearing these masks because it is a signal of your great virtue. <laughs> Damn! Damn. Because for the last three months, we have not worn them. And Ventura County has done outstandingly well and continues to do outstandingly well because we are not Los Angeles. We are not New York City. We never were going to be any of those things. Ironically, this is one of the few things Dr. Levin was actually right about. He has been wrong about everything. He is the one who told us we would have four to 600 hospitalizations a day. He, he, he revised that to two to 400 a day. We still haven't reached that in one day. We're barely over 200 for the entire ordeal that you guys have put us through. We now have panicked over 51 total hospitalizations in a county with eight hospitals. Can you people do math? <laughs> Can you please do basic math and understand where we are on this? This is not a crisis. You, however, have created one. You, in an effort to try to prevent all death, when we've had 43 deaths, have now ended all relevant life. And you should all be ashamed of yourselves. And this will never be forgotten. Oh, Ever here be comes forgotten. a warning. You will all be held accountable eventually, in this life or the next. You all better hope there is no hell, because when you die, that's where you're going. And guess what? You're not going to be dying of COVID either. Mama mia, brother. <laughs> absolute fire flames right now okay i get the anger i get the frustration but my only problem i don't know i don't have a problem with it i guess the thing that is most egregious i guess about the whole situation especially for some states or for some places in the uk or for some places in the world that have done a really poor job is the lack of force some of the governments have kind of you know enforced the lockdown right they haven't they've been a bit wishy-washy um if they just would have said hey we're gonna have a short strict lockdown right two months of absolute solidarity we will fight towards a common we will aim towards a common goal no exceptions for anybody if you get caught breaking the rules you'll be punished or you'll be fined whatever it may be right some um you know 
some level of scrutiny will be placed against you know a guy like Cummings wouldn't be in a job like those kind of things you send a clear message like you know everyone gets treated equally in this situation people will band band around together and you could probably sort it out in a couple of months you could probably get a good a better handle on it than you can now it's just such a bizarre honestly i'm just i'm just perplexed anyway in general i think the virus is what it is but it's just the handling of it is like it's as if like i don't know it's as if like they have no crisis management training whatsoever and that must be something that should be at the top of the list when you become a public official like i said like anybody anybody knows it's no there's no skill or experience needed to cut a bit of ribbon to announce the opening of a flipping you know shopping mall anyone could do that but it's how you handle crisis that should determine you know how you're remembered as a politician or as a public official that should be how you are remembered really and truly you know how did you serve your citizens in the good and most importantly in the bad what can you do moving on moving on moving on next we got duh, 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 duh. oh we got another karen right another karen but this is a funny one i, I don't really like the ones where they try and end the, the person's career or they try and essentially you know yeah get them fired from their job it's just, just a, a funnier one um karen's the karen's that get involved the karen's are um not the karen's are like you know racist this is like there's some mild um what do you call it xenophobia in terms of like go back from where you're from and all that sort of stuff but people love saying people just say that just so they can get under your skin i don't think they're genuinely racist right i don't i don't think i would i'd imagine they wouldn't be right i don't think they'll be that dumb to be that racist in front of the camera i just think they want to just hurt the person's feelings get you know kind of prod away and you know get them triggered so that they hit them or something so that they can scream bloody murder but um i always find that the karen that sort of like you know tells somebody should not do something right the sort of like policing of actions or policing of behavior Karen to be the most egregious and the most annoying like why can't you just mind your damn business why do you need to speak why are you even speaking to me and as well there's this assumption it's sort of an arrogant point of view right to assume that whatever you say i'm going to listen to it is nuts and also it's really reckless because it's as if these Karens don't think especially these um pulling you up for your behavior Karens they have no they have no um, doubt in their mind the interaction is going to go exactly as they please, right? They have no idea that an interaction requires two people and you cannot um, estimate or you cannot um, account for how the other person will react, right? Um, who's to say that, you know, the person that you try and pull up for their behavior hasn't got a bloody blade in their back pocket and they might just, you know, slice the front of your face and open it up like a bloody mushroom. You, you, you have no idea. But yet they're so confident to kind of come up to people and speak, especially younger people. It's just a bizarre way to go around things. And there's no winning, especially if you pull up a younger person, because they're ready to snap. They're ready to go at you. They're ready to insult you, ridicule you, make you like a fool. And it's just really unfortunate because we should be respecting our elders, right? We should be in a place where we kind of, you know, are seeking wisdom and enlightenment and kind of direction in life from our elders, right? Because they've been alive longer than us. They should have picked up some pearls, some wisdom, some jewels here and there that they can bestow upon us. But instead, Instead, we're having to ridicule them and record our interactions with these older folk and post them on TikTok. It's sad. It's so sad. And this is a good example of such occasion. Where's the lady? Here she is, raging with a couple of 16-year-olds. I don't know how old they are, but it's like, come on, lady. Go home to your family, man. What are you doing, woman? But these people are psychotic, so I guess... What can you do if you don't have a family? You go and rage at younger kids in the park and you complain that they're picking up berries. Come on, let's load. Come on, brother. Oh, what is it doing? It's not loading. Come on, load. I gave it a big instruction. Now it's not loading anymore. Ugh. Okay, let's escape. Let's try another one. There we go. One more second. Bear with me. Oh, that's why. Is that that's why? No, it's not. That's not why. Let's see if it loads up now. Come on, son. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Load up if you don't mind. Oh, it's taking a while. Come on, you absolute nutcase. Let's go. Nothing's happening still, it's still loading. Maybe this is Karen Internet, isn't it? When you try and connect to Karen Internet, it just lets you down. I'm not too sure. Come on. I want to show this video for goodness sake. There you go. It's loading now. Okay. Let's get up on the screen here. Maybe I should have just preloaded it prior, but hey, we are where we are. 
it's slowing down. It's not giving me a chance to move. Let's just take some of this stuff off the screen so I can speak to you guys clearly. Okay, there we go. Is it loading now? Cool. Boom. We got it. We got it. So here she is. Blueberry Karen, right? Blueberry Karen. Karen. Okay for this park, we and I don't like park. to see people wrecking it. We're, we're not, we're not wrecking, wrecking it. it. There's oh literally so many berries everywhere. Oh my god, we're not wrecking it. Oh, there's so many berries out here. There's so many berries. <laughs> That's like a form of embarrassment, right? That's when you're embarrassed and you feel like you're losing the argument. She's like, you know, she starts wailing her hands in the air and trying to be mocking or condescending. But really, it's like a weird micro reaction that you do when you feel like you've kind of lost the argument. It's sort of like when you inflect your voice like, oh, am I hurting your feelings? Your, your feelings have been hurt, right? You're the ones that are actually feeling as if you've been aggrieved. You're the one that's brewing inside. You're the one that's considering stubbing that guy, that girl's eye with a pencil that you have in your back pocket because you use it to take the marking down the trees and note how many leaves are on the, are on the grass as you're walking past it. Um, but yeah, it's just a sad existence, isn't it? And they're always the same looking kind of people, aren't they, right? Um, entirely sexless. They've sort of like abandoned any idea of a of kind of looking after themselves. This woman's skinny, but you know she just doesn't look like she's you know takes any pleasure in giving herself a treat in sort of looking after her body, her insides, her hair, her face, her hands. Nothing. It's just you know you're just a, you're just a sack of meat and bones, right? Twaddling around the forest trying to get your your hike on. And you you'd imagine being that connected to nature that you would be you know the furthest away from trying to enact in some sort of conflict right you wouldn't want to have any kind of confrontation you'd want to enjoy the place you're in. you want to you know look at this marvelous god's creation right stand on the ground pick up a bit of gravel have it you know kind of cascade through the your fingertips as you wonder and marvel at the fact that wow this place is like my back garden i have the pleasure of walking around this amazing hillside right in some cases some people would say i'm privileged that i have the ability to walk around in this amazing place with my dad shorts on and my little frumpy pink top that i picked up from a charity shop somewhere because i'm too cheap to buy new stuff because what's the point of living you would expect that but no I'm going to pull up a couple of 16 year olds out picking up berries. Because we wanted to eat some berries. <laughs> you you want, just don't take the bush with you. I'm it's sorry, not the bush, it's literally a, it's a tiny bread. And you pause it. So she says, oh, don't take the blue, blue take the blue bread. We just said, don't take the bush with you. Then you turn around and you think, okay, cool. When we see the picture of the bush, we're going to see some girl like, you know, with like, I don't know, a bin bag full of berries. Fair enough. Even, and again, still in that case, I would not say nothing. It's not my business. If anything, right? Again, I'm not that person. I'm not a snitch. If you're that concerned, the most you would do, you'd pull them up. And then if they didn't know, you wouldn't pull them up. You'd, you'd take note of who they were. And then you'd ring your local, I don't know, park ranger or whatever it may be. And let them know, hey, heads up, a group of girls came in there and essentially cleaned out all the blueberries from this particular section, just giving you a heads up and letting you guys know. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't bloody call them up and be like, by the way, guys, I just saw two young girls wearing Lululemon pants and they took all the berries. And I'm upset. You wouldn't, you're just like, hey, the berries are all gone, you know, re-up on the berries. I don't know. That's what you do. You wouldn't bloody go and try and... You know, engage in some sort of argument and conflict, and it, maybe it's a maybe it's a woman thing. It's a female thing because there is never a threat of violence in these interactions, right? Women never have that, right? It's, there's never a threat. There's never the the threat that this could go f really far. With men, when you get involved in an interaction or an argument or a confrontation, there is that thing in the back of your head where you're thinking, "Hey, if I say the wrong thing or if I act a bit too cute." Right, if I get to a bit too comfortable and if I feel too at ease, this guy could jab my face back into the ground. It's not worth it. So you step back a bit, right? You try and you try and make sure you've got a decent amount of reach. So if this guy tries to hit you with the overhand right, you can lean back and bang, hit him with the overhand right. But hey, what do I know? Of berries. Why don't you mind your own business? Why don't you mind your own business? Look, look. You know, that is the fucking rudest thing you've said to me. <laughs> That's like a teacher when they come in. You know what? They kind of walk over with their hands on their hips to try and make it. You remember when you were younger, that they, they, they used to be intimidating. When a teacher would kind of walk over to you, like, rushing and be like, looking in your eyes. Mr. Singer, what you said to me was, it's like, come on, get out of here, man. Relax. Take it easy. I'm, I'm 10 years old. What I say shouldn't affect you or make you cry, woman. 
Get a grip. Go Buy a dog. Oh, oh, here she goes. Where'd you come from? <laughs> These guys are good. No, I'm not. Okay, yeah. You see how concerned she got when, when she thought they might be <laughs> native. <laughs> you colonize this? I'm so sorry. She would have knelt down. She would have given them her bloody crappy Nike 3.0s. Oh. You're a colonizer. You're, you're, where did you come from? Yeah, where did you come from? Where did you come from? I'm actually curious. Where the did US. You US? Oh, yeah. So oh, you're not, so you're from not here. Canadian either. Yeah, I am. Mm. Oh, so, but we are Canadian too. I was born here. I was born here too. <laughs> okay, like, were you born arguing here? with two teenage girls is no. so long. Okay, so <laughs> They're killing actually, her. Like, I was born here and you know, I've been born here and you're telling me to go back to where I'm Your grandparents weren't either. That's the thing. That's how you know you've lost the fight. Every Karen does that when they've lost the fight, innit? The universal crossing of the arms. Like, huh, you guys, look at you. How dare you? You know what I mean? Like, that's the international I've lost. <laughs> I don't know, man. And as well, even the young girls, go home. Everyone go home. Why are you wasting your time arguing in the bloody f forest? So Americans have such a nice landscape, right? You have this beautiful, um, I think, let's say there might be Canadians, right? You have this amazing forest behind you, right? That you can generally, you know, where we have hikes. My hike is like once it flats, right? <laughs> you walk through a bit, a few puddles. Um, a Labrador comes next to you and starts rubbing up against your leg. You have bird crap all over your DMs. That's not a hike. But Americans have this lovely, lovely landscape. All this amazing greenery, right? Pine woods, forest, you know, great bloody trails. And here they are arguing over blueberries. With everything that's going on in the world, man. God damn you guys. Get a grip. Ugh. Anyway, what do I know? Mix and move. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on. Oh, this is funny. So, um, obviously you've you've seen the feedback and you've seen in the previous episode that Pop Smokes Posthumous Pos Posthumous Posthumous or Posthumous Posthumous? How do you pronounce that? Posthumous? 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 How do you pronounce that word? Um, the untimely death of Pop Smoke is being immortalized with the release of his debut album, right? That's meant to be coming out when? Friday, Sunday or something, right? Um, they enlisted, um, Pop Smoke team enlisted Virgil Abloh to design a cover. Um, according to Pop Smoke's wishes, he wanted Virgil to design the cover. Um, he, didn't get around to, he didn't get around to doing it when Pop Smoke was alive. So he decided to finish it up in order to kind of, you know, um, immortalize him and, trib and pay tribute to somebody that he was obviously fairly close to in his short time on this earth, right? And so far, the cover has been getting absolutely ripped online, right? Being absolutely torn to pieces because it's objectively it's shit, right? That's the that's the matter of fact of it. Um, of course, part of the objection towards it is because it's Virgil. He hasn't necessarily started covid or coronavirus lockdown in the best way right he's kind of been dragged online ever since the two virgil saga and he hasn't necessarily recovered right he tried to come back with a half-baked apology then he came through with a statement about him being very 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 black which you know was one of the most funniest statements i've read in a long long time it reminded me of statements from you know the likes of tiger uh the likes of sway lee you know those kind of uh, really nutty statements that you're like who writ this man who told who raised these guys and told them describing yourself as very very black was a good way to get yourself back in the good graces of work twitter it didn't work it didn't work we can say that now right so he tried very earnestly to come back and to sort of um redeem himself to an audience that was never really receptive of him in the first place right i think you should always just play to your audience right those those to work twitter will never give a shit about Virgil mainly because he's married to a white woman and because he seems like a bit of a dope right I guess so maybe that's why it's a bit harsh but I guess it is what it is you just play to his crowd ignore work twitter don't try and appease them don't try and you know um uh become an ally or anything because they're never going to accept you they just don't think you're one of them it is what it is isn't it he tries he fails he tries he fails and this is another good example of it but in this whole saga the memes have been pretty funny right so somebody on twitter showed um, a really funny um mock-up of how easy it is to design the album cover that um virgil put together um to honor pop smoke and he did it in under what 41 seconds right via <laughs> photoshop i'm gonna get it up here on the screen and show you guys right this is the let me get up on here and put up full screen but this is it look at this let's get back to the front 
So he's essentially got the image of Pop Smoke that he Googled online uh, on Google Images and he's basically put it on the square, ten, I'm assuming 1080 by 1080 pixel canvas and he's essentially just filling in all the pieces to make it look like the cover that Virgil designed, quote unquote designed, it, right? <laughs> and he does it all in under 42 seconds, it's absolutely nuts. Man. People online are so savage. Um, he's doing the overlays, he's already acted. Uh, he's already added the background with the diamonds uh, similar to the what time to be alive album cover from future and, and drake um he's got that sort of smoky overlay on the top he's got the barbed wire that's there <laughs> the signature piece is on it oh my god man this is so harsh and he's adding the, yeah, adding the barbed wire putting it into position and then bang it's all done it's all done right um, and again, I don't think it's a real problem that he did it really. I don't think this is an issue about, you know, um, not doing the design, not to the design, not taking a while, a, a long time to put together. That's not really a problem. Um, you look at the stuff of, you know, you have to look at somebody like, um, who's a good example of this, an artist who, you know, on paper does artwork that doesn't necessarily seem that difficult. I don't know, maybe like a Jeff Koons is a good example, um, you know, work, you know, balloon rabbits and stuff that are essentially what what they made with aluminium or tin or whatever it may be right they're not the most um high brow or thing to make but you know the application of itself the idea behind it is pretty interesting uh people love them they vibe with it and it's Kapoor sort of like weird um uh sort of like you know circular dish things that he puts on the wall they're pretty i guess um, maybe in practice they're hard to make but the idea of it you can also envision yourself doing that as opposed to maybe painting uh, a piece an abstract piece by Picasso or something so the actual application of the thing isn't the issue it's just objectively doesn't look good right but then um you have people like Theophilus London trying to explain away exactly what's going on right and he's getting dragged online as well and I don't know what world we live in where Theophilus London has to act as the PR for Virgil Abloh but it's been really funny to see him kind of defending Virgil's honor and <laughs> what's been going on so this comes from what was it three hours ago right so this is kind of um uh Theophilus London backing his boy and trying to tell us exactly what's going on he essentially first tweets about what supposedly to make everything correct again you also seen fear for something tweets i've also seen the new five louis v's releasing geez come back about to be stupid so obviously you know virgil can do no wrong as long as he designs some cool sneakers that's not the fact actually what you've seen is that virgil's been able to design a really amazing legendary piece of sneaker history with the nike 10 collaboration but regardless of that people still don't seem to like the guy, right? So if anything, it shows that people are able to separate the guy from the product or the man from the artwork and they're still able to drag him consistently online, which I think is really unfair because unfair because I do think if you strip away from all the cornery and all the doofy stuff he does online, he does do a lot of good, right? He has provided his friends with platforms with opportunities to travel the world, make something of themselves, you know, change their lives, uh, put them in contact with people because that's the most important thing, right? In this in working in that industry working in that field working in fashion working in the arts working in the creative field you just need access you need doors to be open you need introductions and once you have them you're set you're gucci but you need those introductions and virgil's really generous with the opportunities that he gets given in terms of you know allowing certain friends to take behind the scene press shot behind the scene, bts pictures do look books creative direct consult um act as inspiration muses mood um mood board consultants whatever it may be he He's really good at that but all this sort of tomfoolery online is really distracting from the overall message and the overall point of virgil being at where he is in his career he's meant to act as a lightning rod and meant to act as a kind of um as a measuring stick of what people should be aiming to do if they want to make an in industry especially if you're a minority right because he works it's just you know insanely hard right he's got a million projects on the go he's collaborating never on the sun he's really diligent in the work that he puts out he's always quick to ship stuff right he's never somebody that's like you know um uh, satisfied with just having a psd file or something and uploading line sheets of stuff that never it never gets made he actually puts the time and the money behind projects back to himself and you know he's essentially been able to ascend up to the top of the mountain but I don't know, man. It just seems like generally people just don't seem to like the guy. I don't, and again, I wonder what it is because not everyone's had the experience I've had where you've had the opportunity to kind of 
work around him or be in his kind of presence most people are just kind of going by what they see online and making a decision but i wonder what it is that just rubs them up the wrong way i wonder I, i'm not really sure but you know i i, I don't think having theophilus london as your pr is a good way to go about things isn't it because he's really capping he's capping on a, he's he's caping story in a major major way he tweeted about the louis five has been a good thing uh what was he saying here he's saying um uh what's he saying here He's saying about, was it, let's see his other tweet here. He's really going in about defending him, right? He says, uh, look at the, the first tweet. Look, the cover of Pop was flexed you early. I want to see a good tribute more than anything. I hear you guys. I hear you. He says, I have my own taste. Backstory was, it was only to stand as a t-shirt first and foremost for his family. We need a banger to dance to. When Big died, we had new music. Plus Puffy and Sting on MTV. Pack was immortalized. It was about every image. I don't know what he's talking about. He must He must have been, he, he sounds like he's on Adderall or something. That's a bit of a mad tweet. It um, doesn't make much sense. And then someone replies and basically tells him it's crazy crap cover it says hey in everyone's opinion coming on twitter screenshot and they call to boast about your glitch to virgil won't change that the cover was trash and some of the laziest shit we've ever seen call a spade a spade which is true in it that's what you want but i guess these people i don't i don't know what it is about some of these people in in the public eye. i don't know especially when they don't have um it's, it's really nice it's really kind of a it's really refreshing when somebody in the public eye is able to understand the current sentiment of society and just kind of you know go with the flow ignore it or kind of you know let it kind of roll off their chest or whatever maybe roll off their back and kind of keep it moving it's when they sort of engage and try and tell you what you're seeing isn't true or there's more to it that meets the eye but they fail to explain because it's too highbrow it's like come on relax now i understand even though i love kanye now i understand why people dislike kanye fans because kanye fans do that a lot right when kanye does something really i don't know let's say he puts some holes in a t-shirt or he designs a, a poster quote unquote and people are like oh man you just don't get it right kanye fans and then people that are neutral are like no it's objectively not good and they're like no 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 kanye is doing some other stuff you just you're not really ready for it it's ahead of its time it's like no it can be ahead of its time later or down the line but at the moment in the current time it's not good and that's the thing with the virgil pop smoke cover it's just not that big of a deal it's not good you go back on the drawing board you redo it or you just say this is what pop smoke would have wanted and you just keep it moving because the most important person in this situation is pop smoke's family and his fans if the family and fans like it you just keep it moving if everyone else doesn't like it you forget it um but then um Pure First London, again, the voice of Virgil announces, I hear you. Our call was about the next album mostly, but since I care about the culture, I brought it up. I wasn't, it wasn't a boast. It was, it was a hit Theo up. He has backstory. Let's start a bigger combo instead of bashing a master. It is a legend. This guy is insane, man. Is it as if this is the time to boast about him being a master? And then, of course, he did the standard thing that everyone does. Anyways, we have we've been distracted as a culture. No, we're not being distracted. You got yourself involved in the conversation. You inserted yourself in an issue that has nothing to do with you, and now all of a sudden we're distracted. These people, man, it's so bloody disgusting, isn't it? Look at him. Anyways, we love to be distracted as a culture. I need y'all to get these books. And of course, you know, you the other books are good, but inserting white fragility in there by Robin D'Angelo is insane, isn't it? That's probably one of the most um cr probably the worst book i've ever read in my life that book is insanely horrible um a white woman essentially chastising white people for being intrinsically racist even when they're unaware that they're being racist saying that there's no hope for racial harmony until whites subjugate themselves to blacks it's an insane book right and it's actually demeaning to black people too because it essentially reduces us to race baiting um human beings who will rest at nothing until the white supremacy is toppled and we are the reigning race it's a diabolical book and of course he lists it and i'm sure he hasn't read any of those books in general uh, i I can say that with my chest. I don't think Fear for London has read any of those books. Um, maybe one, maybe two. I doubt it very much. And he continues here. He says, I decided a long time ago that the less I do, the more artist I am. Okay, David Hammond's quote. Uh, so, yeah, as you can see there, I've got one. I don't know. These guys are insane, man. But, yeah, the reaction has been pretty brutal, isn't it? Pretty, pretty brutal uh, <laughs> in that regard. But the good thing to come out of it has been some of the... Um, uh, some of the alternative album covers that people have been putting together and I've got this thread here from the where's the thread I've got here with the redesigns oh, I do have a thread no I've got some images here of people that redesigned the album cover um, on social media that looks really good um, far better than what Virgil's designed for the time being he could come back with an absolute banger but so far these album covers look pretty cool innit so we've got this one here from a guy called Boss Logic 
um, which is a pretty cool one. So you've got Pop Smoke um, sort of disin disintegrating into some smoke. It sort of reminds me of like a Daniel Arsham piece. That would be pretty cool, right? Um, that really looks amazing. I love that. So that's a far better cover than what Virgil designed. And then we've got another one from a guy called Sunny on Instagram. Sunny underscore what? Sunny underscore 189. And he's got an, quite a, a conventional sort of cover with some roses on it. A little note with some scribbles on it. And Pop Smoke Immortalized there as well. That looks really good. I'm a big fan of that one. Right? That was pretty cool. Um, and then lastly, we have a cover from... That's it, no, no, those, those, just those two. So far, I've seen online that look far better than anything you would have seen from a Verge at the moment. But it's just funny to see the backlash, man. Like, when people don't like you online, man, you just can't win. And I guess the sooner you realize it, the, the sooner he just gets back to working and continuing, you know, pushing culture forward by designing and stuff he does for Louis, doing off-white, continuing with his off-white collaborations with Nike, the, the sooner the better, man. Like, you just can't win. People have decided, they've made their mind up with him, and there's no kind of going back, really. You even see it with someone like Amanda Seals, isn't it? She seems to be like, you know, people are just waiting for her to make a mistake, to then pile back onto her, pile back on. She presented the BET Awards and did a fairly decent job from what I saw, and it was, I didn't really see anyone praising her or anything, saying anything nice. Um, people just, you know, when they don't like it, they don't like you. Even, uh, you know, a good example, Kerry Kardashian's a good example of that as well. She seems to get dragged online regardless of what she does, right? Post a picture of her daughter, people commentating on her face, post a picture of her and her husband, or I don't know, her and her baby daddy, people are commenting on her face again, a relationship. Sometimes you just can't win people online, and the quicker you realize it, the better it will be for you. But anyway, let's move on. Enough of that chatty patty stuff. Next on the list, what do we have here to talk about? um kanye is a real g oh yeah kanye redesigns the gap saw that's a pretty cool one so obviously kanye announced um recently that he's going to be collaborating with gap he has got a 10-year partnership um that he's been able to sign on a dotted line it's obviously a lifelong ambition for him he's always wanted to uh redesign gap or be the creative director of gap and now he has that privilege he's going to be working with a whole host of creative artists that he's going to be using um he's going to be kind of um pulling resources together and reaching out to loads of you know geniuses in their field to make this gap project really go up um and obviously gap is floundering at the moment they need all the help that they can get if he's responsible for reviving gap he will go down in history as an absolute legend <coughs> and it was revealed he kind of did a bit of a redesign of the gap store in chicago the one that i think he used to work in um and it's a really touching sort of tribute it's been entirely wrapped in the sort of like a sheet with a note on the side um essentially um speaking about some of the things he went through to make this uh, collaboration come to life and i thought i wanted to uh, sort of speak about it here so this is from hype beast right and it says here, the title, Kanye West redesigns Chicago Gap Store in light of a Yeezy partnership. And it's really cool, man. They've wrapped the entire store. Um, is it a sheet or is it? It looks like a sheet, right? Or a sort of plastic film with the Yeezy Gap logo on the side. And the writing there, we can actually see it closer. And it reads as follows. It says, thank God. Hi, Chicago. It's EA. Um, this is the Gap store I used to shop at when I would drive my Nissan from Southside. I'm so blessed. I thank God that I'm so humbled at the opportunity to serve. I put my heart into the color palette and every design. I love, what's the other bit there? I can't really see that. It's got the other picture. Hopefully you might have it. What else do you love, sir? Um, I put my heart into the color palette and every detail. I love uh what's that the, of the original uh do you like stuff i don't know what to do with my hands love yeah easy easy so yeah it's pretty cool man i think it's really touching a really amazing tribute i can't wait to see what he does with the actual project i think it's going to be pretty amazing from what we've seen so far the little picture that he's he uploaded on twitter was pretty cool there's a transcript of the entire thing there but yeah it's going to launch in next year 10-year collaboration again it's pretty cool because it allows him to have a, a brand maybe a, a kind of a micro brand or let's say what do they call them? not micro brand what was it uh in fashion when you have a, a diff, sort of like a diffusion line right there's a sort of like a easy diffusion line and also maybe an opportunity maybe um maybe an opportunity to 
you know give a platform to young designers people that aren't represented people that are overlooked a chance to sort of work within an infrastructure a mass market fashion infrastructure where you have to sort of work under different parameters that again i think that's really good learning i'm a big fan of that i think if you're gonna that's what i always say i think if you if you're working in if you're studying in fashion and you want to go intern at a brand or a fashion company you're probably better off trying to intern at gap so you're probably better off trying to intern at like as the george <coughs> or like top shop right or you know something or like primark or something right and trying to somehow um apply your really creative far out wacky fashion se sensibilities and trying to apply it to a really beige avocado green setting like a primark design office or, or design studio i'm not i'm sure they those guys aren't looking at you know balenciaga um you know collections from years gone by right they're just you know they're essentially just trying to make functional um high, you know functional durable clothing for people who are going or maybe or disposable clothing for people that want to have an item to wear to a christmas party or whatever it may be so it's a whole different um design challenge that you have to um sort of address but i think that's a be better way to go about things but i can't wait to see what happens i can't wait to see who collaborates with i can't wait to see some of the pieces i'm sure they're going to be very much in demand and again just what they're going to do in terms of merchandising store design will there be pop-up shops um how how it's going to basically evolve there's a long it's a long-term project 10 years with an option to increase it um to an extra five after the first five years so it's a really big commitment from both sides to really get this going and again we'll see what happens and we'll see how this affects Yeezy Mainline will this mean that Yeezy Mainline will become a little bit more experimental will Yeezy Mainline be um, sort of like condensed in terms of the pieces it does will they approach it differently will it sh be more conventional in terms of how it sort of showcased in terms of Paris Fashion Week and all that sort of stuff will it be widely available will they have a store is there those are questions that are going to be um, that are going to be answered once this gap collab collaboration sees the light of day but so far so good next on the list uh we're gonna say here what can we go for do you talk about let's talk about this actually where is it oh i can't find it where are you let's talk about the chris delia situation right there's been some movement there's been some change and what's basically occurred let me see if i can find it where are you where's the chris delia information there's been some um i guess chris delia basically essentially has um released the receipts of the interactions that he's had with these young girls obviously if you're not familiar chris delia a famous la-based comedian was accused of grooming um grooming teenage girls and also uh sleeping with teenage girls right they accused them of being a pedophile um right at the height of the accusations a couple of girls came out on twitter accused him of trying to get with those girls when they were underage and pursuing them in a sexual manner blah 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 a power dynamic conversation came into place there um me too accusations read the ugly head as well and just in general right being accused of pedophilia is a big heavy serious accusation and from the looks of it uh, from the accounts the ladies gave it seemed like a fairly uh um, you know slam dunk accusation to put out there he's a bad guy he's a creep whatever it may be they released screenshots too by the way that uh, further uh, further um, illustrated that you know Chris did do those kind of things and it seemed like the entire community has seen completely ditched the guy, right? Completely abandoned him. Um, but one thing that really rubbed me up the wrong way when I first saw it was the reaction from Brendan Schaub and Brian Callan. I thought it was really despicable that they decided to cry on, t on their podcast on TV. It's just like, I'm, ne I'm never a fan of people that cry on camera anyway. I think those girls that get hysterical and point their camera in their face and start crying via the selfie camera there's something really psychotic about those kind of people right you're not you're not all there in the head and i think anyone that sort of like cries about their friend as if they're dying because they got involved in the scandal is not a friend i want to have and yeah i thought the video was really really funny so i'm gonna play a bit of it now at the, at the time it happened everyone's like oh man they're so real they, 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 I think they're really emotional about this their friend um going through this mad thing but number one i thought was weird because when the video starts, you hear Brian say something like, oh, I haven't spoken to him, but I'm really disappointed. It's like, why would you speak about something so serious that involves one of your close friends 
without speaking to them first. That's the first thing that rubbed me up the wrong way. I was like, these guys are not friends, innit? This is like a typical Hollywood relationship where they're only friends with you because, you know, Chris is one of the most successful comedians in that scene. He tours, he makes a bunch of money. He's, you know, stamped by Hollywood's elites. He's in Netflix shows and all that sort of malarkey. So it pays, you know, it's, it's beneficial to your career to be associated with Chris D'Elia. Um, but then the moment he does anything wrong, hey, 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 you got to distance yourself. And then you got to go on camera and speak about something that's really serious at the time. Imagine this was right when it happened and essentially cry on camera um, somehow, you know, um, sending out a signal that, you know, somehow this guy's career is done. Because when it happened, you felt as if like, whoa, if these guys are crying on camera, this must mean Chris is completely finished. Then the information comes out. Then you get some more context to the allegation because, you know, we shouldn't be trialing people in social media, right? If he's done, a, if he's committed a crime, he'll be held accountable to it. He'll go through the court of law. His career will be finished anyway, regardless. But to suddenly jump out the window and, you know, throw your friend under the bus is really just despicable. And I thought this video really rubbed me up the wrong way. Again, I have no horse this race i don't know these people i just watched them from afar but this is fairly fairly despicable in my opinion let's play it brennan we have to uh at least talk about this um you guys if you follow the news if you're alive uh if you've been following this twitter thing the way we have uh well, you Brian's know what's already, going on with our friend brendan's already um welling up. i'm not you know that when these situations people in hollywood tell you what to say and um, oh, they, I, 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 oh, I said to they Brandon, told Bra they, what we can do is tell them. They told Bra Bra Brian what to say for sure. Brian deleted every single picture of Chris Leo on his Instagram page and supposedly unfollowed him. I don't know if he did, but that's a rumor on the streets, right? Imagine deleting all your pictures on your profile of your friend, your actual friend. I get it. Hollywood, right? Association. Cool. No problem. Let's say you delete the pictures. Okay, let me, let me give you that because you've got a career too. You've got a special. You've got two kids you got to look after, a wife to pay alimony to, whatever. I understand. Cool. Get it. But back your friend in private, my G. Well, now, we don't know. This could be a thing. But I don't want you talking about my issue just as it happens on your show because you have to. Remain silent. You don't, you don't owe anybody an explanation. You shouldn't have to speak about it in public or issue regarding your friends. People will understand. You'll get some trolls, some you know, some people that want to get a rise out of you saying, oh, why don't you talk about this? Uh, you coward, blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, everyone will understand if you don't want to talk about it. If my friend went through something like this in public, no, well, yeah, in public, right? Even on my level, I'm a nobody and somebody asks me at work hey i heard your friend did x y and z it's none of your business i'm not talking to you about this, this is my friend i've spoken to him privately i don't owe you an explanation and if you judge me because of that then you know go jump off a cliff somewhere my friend the truth and i'm not going to sit here i'm a man and i define myself on how i respond to these situations in real time when the pressure's really on and so this is what i'll say um i always knew chris is a ladies man I have never, and I'm going to say this, I have this. never hey, seen or heard of him doing anything illegal, <laughs> ever. Um, this oh. is as shocking to me uh, as I'm watching this happen. I don't know what to think, and I don't know what to say. I don't. You could have just left it there and said, I don't know what to think, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to reach out to my friend Chris. I'm going to wait until more evidence comes out there. But for the women out there that have accused him, I hear you, I see you. But please allow me the time and the space for me to process information, process what's going on, and speak to my friend. Not, I don't know him, I've never seen him, and then he says, yeah, I haven't told him the guy, like, come um, on. But I have, I'm going to say it again, I have personally never heard or seen these him people, do anything these illegal. People. That's all I can say, and right now I have to believe that. Because he's still a friend. And, and, and it may be unpopular to say that, but I... I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to do. And I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be some, uh, I, I, I just think it's an impossible situation. And uh, I'm, I'm just at a loss. I'm at a loss. <laughs> look, look I'm, at Brendan, praying, Brendan I'm praying, I'm praying that, um, Come on, brother. what I'm hearing isn't He's not true. dead. Maybe that's the best way to put it. I can't talk. It's just. And I have to be honest, at the time it, at the time it happened, I thought it was really weird that they were crying on camera. And if anything, my spidey senses told me if somebody if a man is crying like this over this sort of like accusation regarding his friend and you're a public figure and you had been in Hollywood, most of it, 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 it pays you know, it's fair to say that he's probably worried that his skeletons might get revealed, which leads to the which leads to the whole realization that 
maybe this issue is a good thing in general for the comedy scene in LA, right? They need to rein it in. They're probably going around being too reckless, trying to smash anything that moved that gave them a bit of attention, um, not treating girls with respect, because that's part of the reason why you see Crystal Lea getting dragged online. If you read through, read between the lines of the stories, they're all BS, most of them for the most part, apart from a couple, depending on the information we get so far, it seems like there's a lot of girls who, a couple of them got ghosted, a couple of them had bad experiences with him because he was a jerk, but most of it's because he was a bad dude in interactions, right? He didn't engage, and I think one girl said he hooked up with him, and when she went to the green room, him and his friends were just on their phones, they wouldn't engage in conversations, Chris went straight for the bang, didn't even try and kiss the girl, or, you know, foreplay, nothing, it was just all just him trying to basically tick the boxes right go to a city smash somebody go to another city smash somebody and essentially you know you can't treat girls like that right especially young girls who are impressionable or who hold you to some kind of level of high esteem they want you know if you if you're purporting to be this fun loving guy on the podcast you have to be the same kind of vibey guy in person just treat them with a little bit of respect and i'm sure this issue wouldn't have been a big deal i'm pretty sure of it of course if he's done anything illegal and actually attempted to sleep with girls that are underage or tried to uh, you know groom or um you know pursue girls that are underage yeah if that comes out he's done for but if it's just him treating younger girls like crap he should know better you should know better but again if your friends are crying on camera what does that say for them like for real what does that say for them if he's crying on camera like this it's like it's a weird thing because i said to, to brennan i said it's like um you know, it's it's like watching someone die or something. But he's not dying, is he? Really, and isn't also, it? That's and if he's your friend, you reach out to him so he doesn't die, so you can help him out. <laughs> For fuck's sake! <laughs> you know, I, we I haven't. Just, what's important is that we haven't spoken to Chris. No, and I'm we've never been. We've never been on the road with him. I, you never. know, I was on and the there's loads of pictures of him on the road with him together, or you know performing in a in a comedy store it, it doesn't really matter in it this is a pointless thing they were crying they were they were sniffling whatever it may be right let's move on from them because you know it's pretty despicable going forward and then the other thing that was really funny is that if you think back to it do you remember when harvey weinstein was first accused and everyone started coming after quentin tarantino for his relationship with harvey weinstein look at how quentin tarantino reacted to that news and what harvey weinstein got accused of again I don't, it's not about, you know, um, comparing what's worse, right, in severity. You know, trying to um, pursue teenage girls or underage girls is abhorrent. Try, obviously trying to um, exploit the power imbalance in Hollywood with young and impressionable actors that are coming through to your studio is also abhorrent. And being a sexual predator and whatever the stuff that Harvey Weinstein done is disgusting. But look at how Quentin Tarantino reacted to that first thing, right? And this is somebody he worked with in Harvey who greenlit all these movies, who for all intents and purposes on, from, this, from what Quentin Tarantino's impression of him was that this guy was a good dude. Look at how he reacted, right? This is an article from The Guardian. It says, Quentin Tarantino heartbroken over Harvey allegations. It says here, Quentin Tarantino broke his silence on the scandal surrounding his friend and longtime collaborator Harvey Weinstein. And look what he said. Quentin Tarantino quotes and said, for the last week, I've been uh, stunned and heartbroken about the revelations that have come light about my friend for 25 years, Harvey Weinstein. I need a few more days to process my pain, emotions and anger and memory, and then I will speak publicly about it. That's what Quentin Tarantino said about Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein had, you know, dozens, more than... 20 accounts right coming forward of women of age right women who'd you know with actual experience behind them with legitimacy with proof that he had sexually assaulted them raped them took advantage of them whatever it may be right and still Quentin Tarantino would wanted to wanted to have some um time to pause and reflect before he made a, made his opinions public about his friend because from his side because if you're a monster right you're able i'm pretty sure if you're a monster you're able you're really able to sort of like show different people different sides of your personality some people see the good guy some people see the evil dude so i'm sure queen tarantino was only seeing the good side of harvey Weinstein. he never probably saw the jerk or the creeper dude right for all intents and purposes it's safe to assume that and even in that instance, he didn't want to throw his friend under the bus. But these guys, right, the people who are bastions for free speech, oh, we're comedians, we're the last last hope for free speech, and we, we, we have this podcast so we can say what we want and we can have a few money. The moment one of their friends gets accused of something, they all buckle, throw him under the bus, delete all their pictures from their social media feed, and essentially never mention him again like he's a bloody, you know, like he's the boogeyman. It's insane, isn't it? It's insane. And I hope he's realising that what his friend... You know, I hope this whole experience shows Chris exactly who his friends are. For sure. And then this clip from... Um 
I saw on Twitter really encapsulates my thoughts on the issue. This is Danny Glover talking about the importance of friendship and what actual friendship, real friendship actually means, right? Not this fakey stuff you're seeing displayed on social. Okay. I love Mel Gibson. Okay. So you can say that Danny Glover says he loves Mel Gibson. I, 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 but, you know. but I have I have friends who... Well, I, I'm not, that's, this is not an interview with you. This interview with me. Got it. I understand that. I said all the way. What's your, what's your, hey, wait. No, 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 no. What your friend says that is relevant to your friends, what's relevant to me is that I love Mel Gibson. Do we have another question? Do, do, do you talk? No, I said, I asked you. Okay. You, so you I asked know. you. I, I said, I told you what I felt. I talked to Mel. I mentioned that before. I talked to Mel. I, I, I called Mel on his birthday, January 3rd, and wished him happy birthday. So what's the next question? That's Danny Glover talking about Mel Gibson. Somebody that has a catalog, a catalog of instances where he's proven to be an anti-Semite, maybe, you know, a little bit racist, right? This is Danny Glover defending Mel Gibson, who happens to be his friend. Why? Because he's your friend. We all have jerk friends. We all have people that are abhorrent in our social circles. But you know what? You put up with it because they're your friend, because they provide you with more good than bad. And it is what it is. But this whole, like, throwing your friends under the bus publicly is just, ah, oh, I just, again, and I'm not even, it does nothing to do with me. I'm not even a friend guy. I don't really have that many friends myself. But I just see some people sometimes with these clicky, you know, Instagram friends and calling everyone brother and putting their hands, arms around everybody and saying, this is my boy. And the moment you actually need them for actual, for something, to back you up, for an emotional support, to really kind of maybe stand their ground and really kind of, you know, put their, their reputation on the line to sort of like, you know, help you out. No, no. They all buckle under the pressure. They all buckle. They all buckle. And another good example, Whitney Cummings, right? Somebody who's, you know, instrumental in Chris... Delia's career she even went ham on him as well and decided to throw him under the bus as well and this is even more egregious because supposedly she helped him to hire a lawyer get a lawyer and all that sort of stuff and then since then she's completely ghosted him but she even posted a statement on twitter saying it's taken me a couple of days to process information i've learned about chris i'm devastated and enraged about what i've heard and learned this is a pattern of predatory behavior so she's already assuming that what those girls have said is completely true the first bit is fine right you can be disgusted and appalled cool but to assume what those girls are saying is true is disgusting is really especially considering she was the one the people saying oh me too and believe all women silly and now she's subscribing to her. and again I'm, I'm gonna continue saying if chris is guilty he's guilty but let him have his day in court don't chastise and you know um somebody based on allegations allegations with no proof so far we've had no especially the grooming bit we obviously have seen there's a catalog of instances where chris seems to go for girls that are you know young looking right he tends to like girls who look like they could be underage is that creepy is that a bit weird yes but we see that all the time you go to las vegas you see some old decrepit dude with some girl that looks like she just about graduated college it's weird but do you go around taking pictures of them uploading it so you can cancel them no because you're aware that they're two consenting adults hopefully right Two we have to decide when are when are when are you when are you an adult and when are you a child? If it's 18, cool, that's fine. But that's it. Is it disgusting if a 43-year-old is sleeping with an 18-year-old? Yes. Is it odd if a 40 if a 43-year-old wants to have an 18-year-old girl as a girlfriend? Yes, it is, because you're wondering how what the hell are they even talking about? But let people do what they want to do. If they don't mind it and if they're okay with it, it's fine. And again, if your friend is accused of, be, of being a pedophile, you know what? You know how much weight that term pedophile holds? I think you could, you're probably likely, if you're able to, again, depending on who you are, depending on what industry you work in, if you rape somebody, right? as abhorrent as a crime is can be, you could probably bounce back and salvage your career some way. Maybe you have to move to Europe and learn a language and do stand-up in Lithuania. But if you're labeled a pedophile, you are done, done. Especially if it's, if, it's, um, if it's found out it's true, you're finished. So you have to be very careful. But I guess it's the same thing with racism, right? Oh, racist, racist. People are quick to chuck around that term and it doesn't really hold any weight anymore. It's like suck your mother, right? People say it so often now, it doesn't really have anything. It doesn't really have any punch behind it anymore. Before, if someone said that to you, it's an instant punch, over the fa it's an instant punch in the face. Now it's like, eh. Do you know what I mean? It's like someone calling you a wanker. It doesn't really have the same amount of reverence it did in the past because it's been devalued because people just throw it around. Labeling someone a pedo is a really serious thing. And if he is a pedophile, let him have his day in court. If he's found guilty, cool. Throw the key, lock him away, done.
even if he's found not guilty and the evidence shows that he probably got away on the technicality, his career is still done regardless. But in this instant, right now, there's no proof that he's a paedophile. He just likes younger girls. Mm. He got caught out, I think, with one of them where it seemed like he, you know, reached back out again when she turned of age. That was a bit strange. But technically, it's not illegal. But anyway, here's Tech Willie Cummins' statement. He continues, This is a pattern of predatory behaviour. This abuse of power is enabled by silence. And now that I'm aware, I won't be silent. Oh, my God, Whitney. He's your friend, Whitney. He's your friend. Come on. Um, girls should be able to be a fan of a comedian they admire without becoming sexual targets. It's an adult's responsibility to be an adult. That I agree with, right? That end bit. I think this is an awakening for the whole community of comedy. I think they all, especially the men in the com comedy community, especially the ones that are kind of, you know, young and g going for it. Um, there has to be an uh, acknowledgement that you should be, I don't, I don't know, there should be a level of professionalism. I think if you work in industry, working in a particular industry and you, you know, cultivate a fan base of young girls, it's probably your responsibility to um, be an adult in that situation. I'd imagine, especially if most of the girls coming up to you look really young, it's up to you to, to not really play into it, right? And if you do decide to do mm -hmm. it, um, you have to make sure that they're consenting, you know, they're, they're of age, all that good stuff, right? You have to, I don't know, you have to go through a lot of things to make it work, but I think you should probably be, um, it should probably be let's not fuck our fans thing, right? Just a rule. Don't fuck your fans uh, and don't fuck your colleagues, your peers. Just kind of, it's off bounds. So when you go to work, you go to the comedy store, you treat that as a job. It's an occupation. You be professional. Um, you don't get too intoxicated. You don't get, you know, too high on drugs, whatever it may be. You go there, you do your job, you, you put on a great show so that your fans can rave about you, tell their friends, the world spreads, it adds to your ticket sales and you can go tour the world until the cows go, until you're old and grey, right? That's the, that should be the hope. You shouldn't be trying to, you know, push it to the limit in your infancy right Chris D'Elia is still young he shouldn't be going around trying to bloody smash everything that moves just to, you know as his career is absolutely going for the moon he should just be taking it easy and relaxing that's what you should be doing but come on guys let's not pretend like you know comedy clubs are a bloody church or a Sunday school then oh, Sunday school is probably the wrong term but it's just I don't know I don't know in the end it's going to be a good thing anyway it's going to wake up some of the creeps in the comedy scene to like you know get the acting in order but the lack of absolute loyalty from some of these supposed friends is really frightening, I would say. And it's definitely a war definitely a, a cautionary tale for anyone in the entertainment industry. Be careful who you call a friend. Be careful who you think has got your back because when the chips are down, when you are involved in some kind of controversy, they will throw you under the bus happily. Anyway, that's your next in the Jingle Show, episode number 335. Thanks so much for tuning in. If it's your first time listening, of course, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you listen to the podcast app, of course, leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends. And if you want more information regarding me, make sure you follow me on Instagram. That's Agostino Zinga, all one word. Instagram, Agostino Zinga, all one word. Also on Twitter, Agostino Zinga, all one word. You can find the links in the show notes description. Follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter. And until another time, I'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>